Good evening to everyone. And this is our spring episode of the safety committee. And so I'd like to thank the safety committee for all that they do and for being here tonight. Um, and we have some introductions to make tonight to get things started. I'm just gonna put this on presentation mode. Um, first of all, Catherine, you are leaving us after tonight, aren't you? This is your last, uh, this is your last oh, rodeo. Wow. It so is, uh, it after seven years, I wanna thank you for everything that you have uh, contributed to safety and, and rowing in the US. Yes. And so uh, we'll have one more good ride with you and, and, and say our goodbyes after. Um, Tony and Jim, thank you for joining us. Um, you guys are members of the safety committee for people who don't know them. These are the people behind the scenes that that's, they give up their, their time to contribute to these webinars and uh, policies and protocols and so on and, and help develop our website. Um, the other person I'd like to introduce to everyone tonight is Tom Rooks. And Tom is a new hire at US Rowing and his job will be safety and wellness. So for issues uh, concerning safety, for issues concerning many of the new uh, um, forward thinking protocols that we're coming up with and the processes that we're coming up with for safe sport as well, Tom is going to be the person that is going to be developing that. So Tom, um, you have an extensive career. Why don't you give us some of the highlights and let everybody know what your background is and what you're bringing to the table? Sure, I, I think, um, hi everyone, it's nice to meet you and I'm, I'm really excited, looking forward to uh, working with everyone. Um, I started rowing in high school in Florida, Boone High and then Central Florida a little bit and uh, immediately began coaching out of the desperation of the team that I rowed for. Um, did everything wrong and then I joined the Coast Guard and learned exactly all the things I'd done wrong. Um, I wrote, was in the Coast Guard for 22 years. I worked in search and rescue and law enforcement and eventually um, commanded search and rescue stations around the country. And then my final position before I retired in 2018 was running the school for Coast Guard Bozomates, which is basically a, a 600 person coxswain school every year where we are teaching people, you know, how to operate vessels safely in precarious circumstances. Um, pretty excited about the U.S. Rowing Safety uh, commitment. I, I think that uh, this position is a new position, and it's sort of a demonstration that U.S. Rowing is trying to, you know, improve safety practices and standards, which is pretty good. It's a really important thing. The uh, Safety Committee, I just want to thank the members of the Safety Committee. Many of you served for quite a while here, and it, it's real simple, right? If you care about rowing and you care about rowers and you want to make them safer and have less problems out there, put in the time. And I'm just really excited to work with the safety committee. Um, we have a lot of initiatives at U.S. Rowing that I've been on board to work, brought on board to work on. Um, some of them are mishap reporting and analysis, um, simplifying and improving uh, safety policies and procedures for clubs. I'm, I'm looking to develop uh, coaching, training, and qualification trackers to make it easier for clubs to know where they stand with all the various you know, boating licenses, first aid CPR, things that we, we, we do. And, and big picture, you know, rowing involves risk. No matter what we do, we're a water sport. And anyone that works and, and plays on the water is taking risks. And risks are a good thing. If we calculate them, consider them, mitigate them as best we can and accept them. What I'd like to do is sort of move away from taking chances. I think we do that a little too often and I have in my past as a rowing coach as well, you know, circumstantial pressure creates, you know, tunnel vision. And then next thing you know, you're doing things wondering, is that really the right way to go about it? So I'm hoping we can work together to, you know, do better at managing risk. If I can be helpful to anyone, um, they've got my email address up there. Please feel free to put my inbox to the test. Um, you know, that way you can come at me via phone if I don't get back to you quick, but I just want to be a resource for a community I've loved for 30 years. So look forward to working with you, thanks. All right, so Tom, why don't you uh, lead the way here um, for tonight's webinar? And, um, and I believe, Catherine, this is your slide first. That's right, that's right. Uh, I, for one, I just wanna say uh, that I'm really grateful for the uh, years that I have served on the committee. It's come quite a long way since uh, day one, since I stepped on board. And I uh, am so excited that U.S. Rowing has brought Tom on board and has created this position so that uh, the focus uh, can really be put on safety first. I mean, think about the rules of rowing, uh, the prime directive. Uh, safety comes before fairness. Safety is the uh, top order. 
So uh, that's uh, a great thing, very exciting. Uh, so we've got a really full program for everybody tonight. I uh, just wanted to, to all see some of the items that we're going to be hitting during the course of our conversation. And we hope that it is just that, a conversation. Uh, we'll be touching on uh, COVID-19 developments. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, safe sport because now there is going to be a bit of a dovetail created through Tom's uh, position. Uh, so it's a natural that we uh, bring it up and, and uh, advise you of uh, what we know about any developments and give you some resources. And then we're going to talk about uh, some considerations for spring rowing. And what we're really trying to do, uh, everybody, is to keep them uh, in the realm of uh, safety aspirations because we're fully cognizant that um, rowing clubs in different part parts of the country are, uh, have very different considerations. I mean, we all have many, many themes in common, but a rowing club in the state of Maine won't have the same considerations perhaps as a club in San Diego. So uh, it's important that we understand that we're working towards these goals, uh, that we uh, keep the conversation open so that we can work together to propel uh, ourselves toward these um, aspirations. Uh, what we're going to touch on tonight are when it is that you ought to be thinking about getting out onto the water, uh, when it is that it makes sense to conduct uh, your safety training at your club and or organization, uh, and dealing, we've done this a couple of uh, webinars, dealing with uh, some, what we refer to tonight as member pushback, uh, mm -hmm. when it is that we're trying to make changes and uh, we're met with a little bit of resistance. Uh, how we might strategize to uh, get consensus and uh, move forward with uh, best practices. Uh, we're going to touch on onboarding and updating uh, new members and what it is that you ought to be thinking about getting uh, new people up to speed, uh, understanding uh, all the uh, elements uh, and particulars of safety at your club. We're going to talk a bit about uh, traffic uh, traffic patterns, and uh, we'll move on to some considerations safety-wise for uh, adaptive rowing. And then just our final bucket are, uh, is a collection that we'll be calling uh, other considerations. So uh, I, we can flip to uh, the next slide, please. Perfect. The COVID, there we go. All right, well, we all know that things uh, keep changing with uh, COVID and, uh, you know, uh, as these uh, new uh, variants keep coming out, uh, the landscape changes a little bit. Uh, so U.S. Rowing has a medical committee that uh, is always uh, in communication and they, when they feel it is, um, uh, important to do so, they uh, draft and revise uh, their recommendations for uh, considerations opening, reopening boathouses and return to training. So the uh, link that is going to be in the, uh, the file that you're going to receive, if you haven't received it already, will send you to the most recent version, version 13, which was updated uh, February, uh, yep, February 15, 2022. And for those of you who have read these, um, these versions in the past, what you should know is that um, any updates are highlighted in yellow. So if you have read five of these and you feel you know it, read the yellow, and that's all that the changes are going to be. Uh, same thing with the U.S. Rowing Event Registered Regatta Guidelines. Uh, a version was released in February. Uh, version 9, so you can uh, go to uh, that document as well and see what changes uh, have been uh, made there. Uh, we've posted some of these links before, but it's important that we always do see CDC um, links. Uh, you should be aware of what your state's uh, COVID restrictions uh, are and uh, where it is that your state stands in terms of reopening or uh, potential 
potential lockdowns again or anything that may come up, mask mandates, what have you. Uh, the CDC has a uh, updated uh, quarantine and isolation calculator, I think based on the most recent uh, scientific data. So you can go have a look at that and make sure that if anybody at your club uh, comes down with COVID, you'll know what to do uh, and uh, you know, how they should isolate, quarantine, and whatnot. Now, we all know that uh, COVID certainly has changed, but it hasn't gone away and it's not going away anytime soon. So uh, it's important that we all stay apprised of all CDC guidance. So there's that link right there, CDC guidance. It just brings you right to the CDC uh, COVID-19 page and you can go uh, and find whatever data you need. But two interesting uh, tools that you can find there are uh, your personal counties integrated view where you can find out what's going on in your local area. And then there is, I don't know if this is a new link that they've posted, but it's something that a lot of scientists have been uh, tracking for a long time. And that is uh, the RNA levels, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA levels in wastewater. Now that is an interesting um, bit of data uh, if you are trying to look to see if something might be um, impending in your area. Uh, so uh, for those of you who are interested, you can have a look of that at that. Okay, I think we're ready for the next slide, please. Catherine, if I could uh, just provide a little additional information. The, um, sure. We're looking to update those policies for all the coaches out there. Uh, we're looking to update the policies for COVID for both reopening and event guidelines prior to our youth regattas, um, our youth regional championships being hosted. So you should be seeing, we're hoping to get something to you in the next few weeks. That way you're aware of the considerations to make prior to attendance at one of our events. Super. Well, thank you. That's great to know. And, um, you know, if uh, the folks out there are uh, looking for that uh, on the U.S. Rowing uh, website, there on the top line, uh, the top bar, there is a COVID-19 button, and uh, that's where they can find it is on that COVID-19 page when it becomes published. So thanks, Tom. Actually, uh, a lot of us wanted to know that, so uh, very, very helpful. Uh, moving along to matters of safe sport, uh, we, a lot of you know, that uh, the provisions for uh, safe sport for 2022 are uh, a little bit more stringent. Uh, it's important that every club, uh, every member, uh, every adult uh, needs to understand who it is who must take safe sport training. Uh, things have changed in 2022 if you are legally an adult and are participating in a club. Uh, it, we, you know, at the club where I have coached, um, you know, we have some athletes, uh, junior athletes who have turned 18 in their senior year. And if they're going to U.S. Rowing uh, uh, Register, regardless, they uh, will have to complete their safe sport training. Uh, there is a button there for uh, frequently asked questions that can give you a lot of the answers that you might have. Uh, there are a lot of resources here that we have links for. And, um, the uh, U.S. Rowing webinar that was uh, presented back in September of 21 to present all of these changes that uh, are in effect now, uh, you can go and look at that webinar uh, and uh, get yourself uh, educated and informed uh, about uh, 22 provisions. Uh, during the uh, U.S. Rowing Convention back in December, there was a workshop about how to create and update your a club safe sport policy, which is another component of uh, being compliant with safe sport. Uh, you uh, can, through this uh, presentation, uh, click on, you know, start your training here. If it is that you need to refresh and uh, if you've done it before, you should be getting either emails or alerts that uh, it's time for you to uh, get yourself up to speed, up to date on your safe sport training. Uh, you can get into your training there. Um, if you're interested in uh, looking through and accessing uh, reporting documents, uh, I found this very interesting. You have to uh, scroll to the bottom of the page that this uh, link will send you to, to uh, find the 
entire list of documents that you can uh, scan through. Uh, but it's good to know that they're there and that they're available for you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if there are questions, you know, Tom is your resource, but uh, if you want to just send through generally, you can uh, reach out to Alyssa either at US Rowing Safesport at usrowing.org or member at usrowing.org. And uh, your question can be uh, you know, sent to whoever uh, it makes sense to uh, who might be able to answer uh, what it is that you uh, are wondering about. Uh, just one little thing, and maybe um, anybody here who is a little bit more expert on safe sport than I, just one of the things to make sure of is that when you are going through your training that you are associating yourself with um, your club or US rowing, just so that uh, you, you, know, you are not just training out there in the abyss and uh, it's hard to find your certifications. So, um, you know, I'm not necessarily the, the expert on that, but I'm sure that that question can get answered, but I know that it's an, an important component of your training. Yeah. So hey, Kat, that's would I you give to... a quick, I'm sorry, to, uh, would you give a quick, uh, for those people who don't know in the audience, what safe sport is? What it actually sure. is. Yep. Sure, sure, sure. Um, well, it's uh, it is it is um, U.S. law uh, that uh, that uh, sports that are associated with uh, the U.S. Um, Olympic Committee uh, have this sort of mechanism in place to um, uh, assure the safety, uh, mm -hmm. primarily, of uh, youth in our sport. And uh, it is, uh, the training itself is training uh, to uh, recognize and know how to report um, abuse uh, in all, all senses and all forms to the appropriate, um, to the appropriate authorities and what have you. And uh, so this is to help uh, make sure that our youth are uh, trained in an environment that is not only supportive, but is an environment that is uh, safe from abuse. Mm -hmm. So um, perhaps Tom, if I didn't quite um, hit it entirely, maybe you have something more to say? I think you nailed it. I, I, somebody had asked the question about, you know, defining safe sport and it's, you know, it, it's pretty broad ranging, but it's a pretty important step for us to really show you know, respect and care for a topic that as we look at other Olympic sports around us and any any kind of uh, youth engagement that, you know, we, we clearly have to show a commitment to and do better at. Thanks, Catherine. Terrific. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think we can uh, move along to uh, next slide. Yeah. Good, that brings me into the play. Um, Chris, am I right that, and Tom, that this uh, presentation is being delivered to any of the participants that um, are coming on board? Can they access this again with all those links and stuff? Yes, the links are all, the hyperlinks are available to them and we'll make sure the presentation is posted. Good. Okay, well, yeah, I wish I, you know, I can see our five panelists and I love these people. It's a privilege to be on board. Thank you, Catherine. Ah, you, you do so much for us and you'll continue. You're just stepping back right now. Um, there's 81 <laughs> participants. I can't see you guys, um, but I, I know many of the names and, and you know who you are. So there you go. When do we get it back on the water? Well, we started this presentation a, a, a month ago or more and, you know, it was still frigid here in the Northeast. So uh, many, probably most of you are, are getting back on the water, but how, how vivaciously are you getting back on? And as Catherine pointed out, you know, it depends. San Diego is different than Maine. Maine may be just starting to get on the water. Um, uh, masters may be only, uh, may, some masters clubs probably not. Who knows? Um, but regardless, it changes depending on where you are. Um, the second point is regattas, should or should, we, we don't want regattas to, we'd prefer that regattas did not press somebody into an uncomfortable and unsafe environment because of, of that. Uh, you know, there's pressure and I understand that and we understand that, but um, it, you got to be prudent. Um, what's happening with the weather? 
uh, here in the Northeast, one night it was 23 degrees. The next day it was 59. It was just, it's, it's just nutty. So uh, um, it, we have some pretty big swings here and that changes things. I got a call two days ago. I was in, I was in Texas, but I got a call from our, uh, one of the coaches saying, uh, the, the dock is so icy. What do we do here? You got any tips? And I said, yeah, I do have a tip. Take your sneakers off, walk on socks. That'll actually help you in that slippery, icy environment. He said, thanks. So, you know, we have different demands depending on where you are. Um, review checklist, review equipment needs, radios, launches, safety related. I'm gonna make a checklist of checklists. And um, so, it, you know, now you coaches out there and you boatmen and, and athletes, whomever, directors, it's, it's time to make sure everything's in order. And uh, now is the time. Uh, at least start here. Uh, most, I'm sure most of you have. Uh, update contact information and related signage. When we talk about that, it's, it's, uh, most, it's, uh, it's emergency numbers. Do you have on your launches a, a placard that might have um, uh, either emergency numbers, other coaches' phone numbers, things like where is the best, uh, we have an emergency, where's the drop-off point, what's that location called if I had to call 911? There's there's things that you can do to, to expedite. If you have an emergency, where you have to go. That's the, son, the signage in the launches and on the site. Um, and then uh, boat class, you know, getting on the water, boat class size and other considerations. Uh, the safest boat out there right now would be a barge, big and fat and a tub. And that's that's where you might teach your learn to row people. And then the, the, the le most precarious boat out there is a single. Um, in the Northeast, we're barely getting into singles, at, if, if that at all. Um, and uh, it depends on where you are. If you're in San Diego or in, in Florida, singles uh, with appropriate coaching are okay. Uh, new coaches, boat license certifications. You know, we take on new personnel during the winter. Here we come springtime. Is your new personnel um, classified or qualified? So that's the kind of thing that you got to checklist. Is that taken care of? Do all my coaches have current boating license? Mm -hmm. And um, lastly, every club should have a, uh, a safety uh, safety plan, a safety meeting, kind of a preseason get together, uh, just specific to this, and and uh, verify that all the coaches and and constituents are on the same page. We've uh, formed our own in Norwalk River Rowing. We've formed a safety committee. We've got a Zoom meeting this coming Friday. We're 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 still hashing out the written plan. Um, like Catherine allowed, it's aspirational. I can't tell you that we all, we're all set. We got everything. No, we're working on it. Yeah. And maybe you are. And, and and keep working on it. That's what we got to do. Uh, by the way, there's a miss. There's a noted absence in our panelists right now, and that's Matt Logue, and he's still on the safety committee. He's such a great and talented guy. His it, something happened in his family. His father, he had to go travel and visit him. Something happened that prevented him from being here tonight. But he prepared much of this, so I want to shout out to Matt in his absence that he's he's uh, yes. he'll be here. Yeah. All right, Chris. Who, who's got this slide? It's Matt and Jim. You. <laughs> you. <laughs> Me. All right, yeah. who's in charge of safety? Well, you do need a point person in your club. You know, that's the bad guy. Safety is not fun. Come on, every one of you guys. Thank you. 82 people are here saying, all right, I got to get through this hour. Um, it's not fun, but it is rewarding and you have a sense of accomplishment if, if everything's in order. And certainly when, when things go awry, you go, oh, why weren't we on the safety barge? So who's in charge of safety? You gotta, every one of you that's on this, uh, this, this webinar is in charge. There's wet training, that water emergency training, there's, uh, uh, which was presented, University of Washington, I think did a number of, web, they're on YouTube. And look at that link there. And that's, that's eye-opening. That's pretty cool. Um, we invited the local fire and police EMTs to our site two weeks ago, and they they did they showed us a cold water rescue training, how they go in the uh, how they uh, get somebody um, in a, in a cold water scenario. Of course, you should know that we want nobody to be swimming. If a boat, if somebody goes in the water, your biggest life preserver is not only the life preserver but your boat. Nobody leaves the boat. 
But things happen, and they showed us how if somebody was floating, how you do it, and it was it was eye opening. Big tip I learned is never go face to face with somebody. Have them turn around, and you grab them from behind because they're flailing, and they're going to take you down. And I didn't know that. And uh, they said you got to just command that that the person you're saving turns around, and then you grab them, and then you can pull if you had to swim. That's the last order of defense. You want to give a life ring to them. You want to bring your boat up to them. You want to grab them in the water. Nobody wants to go in the water to save somebody. So I'm ahead of myself here. Um, hey, Jim. Yes, sir. Um, Please do. So just something to, to weigh in additionally for folks. When you're questioning, looking into, are you ready to get back on the water and what's the state of things? The Coast Guard Auxiliary does free voluntary, free voluntary inspections that have no consequences. Right. So the auxiliary in your area will come to your boathouse. They will check your coaching launches. They'll be befuddled by your rowing shells, but they'll check your coaching launches. They'll do a quick inspection, make sure you have everything you need. And the cool part about that is they'll give you a sticker if you're fully compliant. They'll let you know, lets other people know you've had a voluntary safety check. And that's just a really good way to demonstrate to your membership and anyone concerned that, hey, we take this seriously enough that we got inspected. Thank you, Tom. The um, the last bullet point, evaluate your club safety measures with U.S. Rowing Safety Audit. There's where the rubber meets the road. And and every one of you, when you hit this, you're going to go, oh, we may, oh, we need to do this better. Or or we've checked them all. We're, we're in great shape. I envy you. I'm, uh, we're getting there. Yeah. But it's it's important to uh, do that safety audit, that, that link will be provided to you. And it's, it's eye-opening. Mm -hmm. Next, Chris. That's you. <laughs> Again. And here we are. Dealing with pushback. Well, like I said, safety is, is tough. You know, how do you manage the eye roll? Yep. It's it's gonna happen. Every every club has uh, has uh, people that are ready to dig in and just say, No, um, you know, this is the way we've always done it around here. Why are you changing things? Well, we used to drive around in our cars in the seventies and sixties without seat belts too. But look at where we are now. The the safety provisions. And I I, um, I used to be a motorcycle drag racer. Talk about risky behavior. But I did it for 15 years, and I'm here to tell you that because I went through safety meetings and because I got tech, I had a tech inspection every time, and if there was a drop of rain on the, on the drag strip, they wouldn't let us run. So risky re behavior with proper protocols can, can keep you alive. And so this is what we're doing. Um, you know... Every coach is one part philosopher and one part technician. Meet them where they are. Recognize hardships. Don't challenge your constituents by uh, demanding that we have to do this. We it's it's hard. We have to. We got to work our way into uh, um, being safer. Being safer simply means that we may be restricted. Uh, that's the way the world is. Um, responsibility, liabilities. Here's here's the line that I've heard. Don't worry about me. I'm going out on my own. You know, this is, I'm taking responsibility for myself. <laughs> well, you won't be around when your family decides to sue the club because you, you fell overboard and you drowned. You won't be around. It's, it's so we can't accept that somebody is, uh, is responsible on their own. And even uh, some type of waiver, I doubt it. I think any good lawyer would, would just tear that up and go, that's crazy. So it's up to the club to make sure they ensure the proper protocols. And uh, one of the things, uh, oh yeah, and the rescue crews, you know, if, if one's out there and, and there's an incident, now that's not death, but just an incident, it costs money. It's real money. You got to send rescue crews out there and uh, do stuff. So it's, um, it, and then you're noted as being, you know, unsafe because the, the, Paper says, look, local emergency crews went out to rescue the rowers. Oh, what, what were they doing wrong? So lastly, what I'll leave you on this slide is uh, as, as how do you handle pushback? Well, we're going to have guidelines and there's going to be rules and then they're going to, some are going to morph into hard rules. Right. And there is a distinction. Not every rule, every time that we impose something is going to be a hard rule. Uh, there's room for all. So that's... Uh, it's a work in progress. Jim, if I could weigh in on that, the, um, a couple of topics there that, that speak to mind is, you know, we, you're going to get pushback and you're also going to have, we all have a lot of external pressures, 
right? We, we, I think my team might row once this week before the regatta, you know, and that's it, right? Because the weather might look that way. And we get that pressure and we start letting that pressure um, give us tunnel vision. I mean, I think really truly tunnel vision is the biggest problem we face, you know, in leadership positions when it comes to safety. If you build in interrupts to that process, you usually come to the right decision. Meaning if you're sitting there and you're having that debate of, gosh, I just don't really know if it seems like the right thing. I think we're within the 90 degree rules of our club. Well, if you build an interrupt that says call the club president when in doubt, um, if you build an interrupt that says gather the coaches up, if you have any, if anyone has any doubts, there will be a gathering of the coaches. You will spend 10 minutes discussing it. If you build an interrupt of the tunnel vision, people usually come to their senses. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, you need to structure something better for your club as far as your policies, right? But if you build those interrupts and get a dialogue going, the safety, if safety is being viewed at your boathouse as a, as a checklist flowchart way of avoiding trouble, it, it's really not respecting the rowers and, and how much vulnerability they have in our hands. So, you know, really, really make this a dialogue. If you get risk to be a discussion you have openly, if you can have transparent discussions about it, usually people come to their senses and make the right choice and don't let time be the constraint. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Well, this next part is mine. It's updating new club members. And uh, one thing to think about is since the pandemic with our two years off, it's kind of created this population that wants to be outside now and wants to be on the water. Although many of them don't even have any ideas about outside water, weather conditions, the variety of variables that we face every day that we don't even find significant. And because we understand them and we prepare for them. But those people that are naive to even rowing, they, they don't consider that at all. And so when new people come in, it's really important to do the in-house training, utilizing various forms of, of information. Um, one good form is a video. Um, the other thing is to stop that video at various parts and talk and do consistent messages to your groups over and over again. Whether the video is playing or not, we as coaches have that kind of in our brain. So it's important that we don't just think it, but we talk about it to our rowers. It's important to quiz, to check for understanding what they understand. And if they have questions, answer those questions. And then also making information readily available to them um, in various manners, either through um, literature or um, just little notes to them about something that happened on the water today or, or stopping in places where incidents have a higher possibility. On our lake, we have a horseshoe lake and if you're if you're not really watching where you're going around the corner and somebody else isn't following the boat the boating pattern you could have a terrible crash there and sometimes that has happened at our lake but mostly that has happened with those people that don't follow the traffic patterns like skiers or uh, or boaters or kayakers or longboarders or even fishermen so really it's really important to help rowers understand that not everybody follows the traffic pattern, nor do they have to. So it's important that your group does and they kind of manage each other and take care of themselves. You want to take advantage of your younger club members with um, because they're pretty tech savvy and they really like to do videos and presentations. So if you could um, if you could get one of your junior high school or high school kids to do some videotaping when you're out there and then put together a little video that you could put on YouTube even, that would be great for your members. And they always like to share what's happened at their own club. So the other thing is sharing videos with visitors to your club. And one of those videos that's really pretty important is a video of your entire lake. Oftentimes, because we have a U shape, people go around part of the lake and they say, well, I don't know where to go now because it's not a circle, it's a U. And so they, they tend to get lost in the U, which is really crazy, but we don't have a video production. And um, Three Rivers has done a great job of, of doing a video on their course. And there is a highlight here that you can check into and just look at their video structure. It's about a 5,000 meter piece that they show. And they demonstrate, they show all of the bridges and the hazards that could be there on the water. So take advantage of looking at that video. It's pretty cool actually. And Tony then we'll also, uh, Tony, it's also in the chat. If you guys want the, the direct link to that, you'll find it right in the chat. 
Yes, and then they could go to it. Thank you. Um, the other thing is how to orient new members to um, racing and differences in training, because we do have a kind of a different training pattern. We don't just train for um, sprints all year. We do the sprint and we also do the, um, the, the long head races. And there's a big difference in that training. There's also a difference in what you wear during each one of those training seasons. So clothing, clothing traffic patterns, and the routine of what we do, it changes over time and people need to be aware of that. Oftentimes your new club members don't have a clue and you'll see them come in and the most ridiculous things to stay warm or the most ridiculous things to say uh, so they don't get overheated. And sometimes those things don't really work in boats. You get caught in the seat or they get too heavy when they're rowing or they get caught in their sleeves. So really talking about those things that could be hazards in the boat is important. Um, when we talk about preparing your club leaders to share best practices and mentoring, I think that that's pretty doggone important, especially with, um, you know, old, older practitioners moving away and younger people really, there's this spread between the youngies coming in and the older's going out. There's not, um, there, there's, there's not, a, it, there's not nobody in between that space. And so for young people, their vision of the world is very different from a 65 year old's. So I think it, just re relying on each other for what we both recognize is really important and can be shared in clubs nicely. And then another thing um, to help with people learning about how to travel in a boat is make sure that your coxswains or your bow seats are properly trained because they really run the boats when you're out there with a the coach. He's got two or three boats with him, but your coxswain and your bow person are always looking to see what's going on. And if you don't train that into your newbies, they don't look. And then when they get out there by themselves, that's when the problems arise. So you really want to be careful to make those um, times and, and have them off the water so that you can talk about possible things that could could and do occur out on the water. And I utilize our old coxswains as well as newbies coming in so that they can ask questions of the old coxswains and they usually have some really good answers. Scheduling Excellent. time with everyone so that they can all join in, maybe doing a Sunday morning or a Saturday morning, doing an extra session, especially with their newbies and new coxswains. Hey, Tony, if I can just uh, yeah. interject the uh, yeah. when you talked about coxswains and um, your bow seats really important thing for us too in the in the uh, the overwhelming amount of bow loaded boats we have now you have a lot of coxswains that don't have a vantage point that's going to give them the ability to keep the boat safe yeah. so a really important discussion is to have your stroke seat or whoever you you know probably your stroke seat uh, learn what communication they're going to give to that coxswain and that bow loader that way that that coxswain you know can sort of have eyes in the back of their head via the stroke seat we yeah. see that at regattas with race officials we see it in practice all the time just really getting those two to have a, a bit of an understanding of what what are you going to let me know and when and how are you going to do it good information one of the things i'd like to add tony uh if matt logre was here he would uh tell everybody that at Three Rivers, and we keep referring to Three Rivers because they have an amazing safety uh, series of safety protocols. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I believe that at, for their coxswains and their bow seats, that they have to be signed off on before they're allowed to hit, head back to the water. But one of the things Matt is very clear on is that the buck stops with him. He's the one. He makes all decisions about who can and cannot go on the water. And yes, he takes into consideration of whether or not you're the coach of crews that are novice or whether or not you've been rowing on the water for 30, 40 years. He takes all those considerations in, but if you have to ask, he's going to make the decision, number one. And number two, he's not going to have some high profile junior coach or some high profile anybody tell him anything. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, he's responsible for everything and he is the, he is the final say in every situation. So there's a lot of clubs where you have these you know, really important coaches that just say, well, you guys don't have to go out, but I'm going out. Yes. And in Matt's case, he's the executive director and he just says, no, you're not. Nobody's going out. Mm -hmm. And so it's important that there is a, a person that the final decision resides in. And it's not a free for all where coaches get to make their, they get to choose whether or not they're going out. Because many of the younger coaches haven't been through the situational no. um, right. issues and will say, well, it's not that bad or they won't think ahead and they'll go out. Um, so you've got to have somebody who everybody understands is in control and is making the decision and the decision is final, mm -hmm. period. So um, 
Chris, along yes, along with that, something something for all of us too. Like the people on this webinar are people who are curious about safety and probably doing a lot of good things out there. And what I'd say is it's also your job to raise the next generation of coaches at your boathouse. So when you have a coach, when you're looking at a situation, you're deciding what to do about. It's important they know you have the final authority, but one thing I think is uh, critical that, that I've tried to do is bring them into the conversation. Do you think we should be having practice? What do you, you know, challenge, challenge the premise with me. And then also, even if you've given them the authority, you know, when we cancel practice, okay, it's a hailstorm. Still have them make a phone call to you so that you can reinforce their good decision making. Hey, you know what? That was the right thing to do. I hear the ingredients you you weighed out there, and that's that's a really good way to do it. You're going to build in them the ability to sort of have your back and the rowers' backs. Mm -hmm. So it's good for them to know the vertical authority, but also make sure you're raising that next generation of safe coach. Mm -hmm. This is yours, Jim. We have a busy waterway in Norwalk, Connecticut. Um, there's four clubs on the river. And so uh, the four of us, four clubs got together and we kind of determined our, uh, our traffic patterns. And it, and it was complicated. Um, the Norwalk River Rowing, Maritime Rowing, Connecticut Boat Club, and Fairfield University. Um, so we had a professional graphic artist do this wonderful large map. And, and uh, we have copies at both Maritime and Norwalk River Rowing, which is about six foot tall and about three feet wide. It's huge. And you can see this was done very professionally. And this is only, a, a, this is about two thirds of it. We've lost a little bit of the top and we've lost a little bit of the bottom. But as you can see, it's uh, it's got arrows and it's complicated. And that's, so that's why we had to clarify it. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a lot of bullet points. So this, this some form of this should hang in, the, in an area in the boathouse where you can, where athletes can review it, coaches can review it and understand where the problem areas are and, and the, uh, the emergency areas. Um, let's go to the next one. Perhaps to Jim, be available online on your website. Yeah, that, there you go. Uh, it, anticipating this, this meeting, this is a screen grab I got off of Google Maps and you can go to 3D view and you can click off all the, you know, the Dunkin' Donuts and all that stuff and just, just <laughs> have it show this. And you got to do some settings. And then I, it took me 15 minutes. I want to find the Dunkin' Donuts because I, I want one right now. But it took me about 15 minutes to do this. I'm a professional photographer. I, I work with graphics, but I'm, I'm an anomaly at over 60 knowing to do this. What Tony pointed out is that the young athletes in your, in your organization, they, they can do this like nobody's business. <laughs> and, um, Take a look here. This is part of our river. We got three bridges within, um, you know, 2,000 meters. We got tight points. I did some arrows. So this is just one example. And the tight point, you could blow this up. You could do a large map, which has everything. And then you could just get a complicated area and just blow that up and just say, this is how we would handle this. So this is this is just a good example of how you can do this and using Google um this is Google Maps. I went to Google Earth and it gets even more in depth. So there's so that it's a larger um, discussion than this this webinar can allow. But I, I, I encourage you to explore both of those tools. And uh, I'll just tell you, I did a screenshot of Google 3D Google um, Maps and then I created this and it took me about 20 minutes. Go ahead, Chris. Well, this one's fine. Adaptive consideration. Did Chris want to say something? Sorry, Chris. It's okay to go on. Yes. Okay. You're good, Tony. Um, this is for adaptive considerations. And uh, a lot of clubs are adding an adaptive program to their um, other programs. So usually they have a separate turnout for adaptive rowers. Um, that allows them to take more time to get down to the dock. It allows them to not be out there if the temperatures are very high or very low. A lot of uh, people with adaptive um, difficulties who need to have the adaptations for themselves on the water suffer from temperature regulation of their bodies. So you really have to be aware of how um, the cold will affect them and how the hot heat will affect them. And it's much more serious than with our routine rowers who can tolerate a little bit more in hot and cold. There's a, oftentimes accidents around the boathouse 
um, with adaptive rowers. Um, you just have to be really aware and not have um, things out in the aisle way or um, things set where they might not see it or could fall against it. Your adaptive rowers aren't quite as steady with their bodies. Sometimes you have blind rowers. We have two blind rowers and we have a couple of people that are hard of hearing. So you can't say look out because they won't hear you. And if they can't see, they can't even see where they're walking into. So it's really important to facilitate a clear area for them to get down and up to the water from your boathouse. Oftentimes your turnouts can't be either too early or too late in the day because that accommodation doesn't really work for them as far as even driving sometimes on the road. And then once they get there, there's ice or darkness and they don't tolerate that very well either. Um, sometimes it's fun to meet up at other locations other than the boathouse because for the adaptive rower, they have lived their lives oftentimes for a long time in isolation. So that social interaction they get just like all of us rowers get when we're out there on the water or on the lake is really, it's really almost doubly important to them because they don't have that opportunity anywhere else. And now they have an opportunity to talk about a sport with somebody else and not what's hurting them today or how bad they feel. So that social interaction is a really important piece to keep going. I think there's a couple other things on this. Um, we, Oh, let's see. Yeah, we also talked about things like um, the WET program, having them come out and take a look at what's going on with, um, with you in, in the boats and managing adaptive people out of the boats with um, the Coast Guard or the local fire department. A big consideration is um, when people get in a boat and they're paralyzed from the waist down, they do fix, what we call fixed seat rowing. They're strapped in. And if their boat goes over, they have trouble getting out of the boat because they've got to pull a strap. Or if you're in there to try to release them, you have to know which side they were strapped into. There's no routine strapping. Some rowers get strapped to the left and others get strapped to the right. It is dependent on the rower in this situation. So you have to know as the coach, which way they are strapped in. Um, what else was I going to tell you? Yeah, I think that that's where I it was going to end. Um, what, I guess one of the other things is how close do you coach not to get your lunch too close to them and cause wakes. And then um, always thinking about what is your plan on the water? So you ask them what if, or you ask yourself what if and come up with a scenario and then try to figure out what it is you do. Tony, I think we also said that if you're going to have the straps, make sure that the straps are consistent in the same direction. Right. right so that right. you weren't searching all over for them. Yep. Right. On that person, they should be consistent, like both on the left or both on the right. Yes, exactly. I think that's the end of mine. Okay. Um, one of our final slides is uh, sort of a bucket to. Uh, accumulate some of the uh, other things that we want to make sure that we touch on tonight. Uh, a lot of, we do get a lot of questions on the safety committee. Uh, we get a lot of emails uh, with uh, questions specific to a club. Uh, what we want everyone to know out there is that there actually are lots and lots of resources on the U.S. Rowing website mm -hmm. already. Uh, it doesn't mean that they will answer every single question that you have, but it's important for you all to go to the U.S. Rowing website and visit the uh, safety expectations page because uh, there's a long uh, tome we have uh, worked on over the years to uh, try and hit lots and lots of uh, areas and uh, give guidelines. Uh, and uh, you're going to find uh, a lot of items in there. I mean, one of them really is about uh, swim tests and physical examinations, knowing uh, what it is that your club ought to uh, provide as a swim test, what the expectation is, uh, sh you know, are you uh, having your rowers uh, getting uh, physicals before they come to you and start participating in programs? Uh, do you collect those? What do you do with those? Uh, how do you keep them? Um, uh, keep everybody's privacy intact. Uh, we want to talk tonight, uh, and we have for the past several webinars about PFDs. It's important that we do that uh, and because it is uh, an important part of our sport. As Tom was pointing out, it's a water sport. 
Uh, there are inherent uh, risks involved. And so what we uh, strongly urge every club to do is to normalize uh, your practice with PFD. Mm -hmm. Make them intrinsic to your programs. I'll just tell you at Maritime, where I have been coaching and rowing for the past several years, uh, we, at any single, doesn't matter what kind of single it is that goes out, has a PFD in it. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, um, a colder uh, rowing uh, practice, which uh, is, uh, is, was in uh, a, uh, one of the webinars that we had, the most recent, the winter webinar, where it is at certain temperatures and certain types of weather, you're going out in the water, you wear your PFD. And it's the rule. Jim talked about rules, hard rules. That's a hard rule. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, you really need to uh, discuss this in your club, make it an open conversation, have everybody uh, come to the table uh, really with a rational approach, understanding that uh, we want everybody to be safe. And we want to make sure that uh, what your club does uh, is and makes the most sense. Now, I provided here in this slide just a few links. Now, these this is not comprehensive. These aren't the uh, the be all and end all, but they are just some interesting links if you want to start educating yourselves on PFDs. Uh, the National Association of uh, State Boating Law Administrators has a uh, site where they provide a dashboard where you can uh, educate yourself about PFDs. You can uh, go to their uh, state tool, find out what your particular state's uh, recommendations are. Very interesting. And you should know, uh, you know, it, you're, we're talking about rowers, but we're also talking about coaches. The states are different uh, for who needs to wear what at what time of year. And you need to know what your state says. Um, we have on the safety committee had conversations about, uh, you know, those wonderful good old fashioned orange life jackets that everybody wears. Guess what? That foam degrades over time. And if uh, you use them as much as we do at our club, uh, they are not going to last uh, all that long. Uh, I think that uh, the industry says that if you take good care of them, they might last a decade. Well, ours don't. Uh, you need to replace them because after a while, they're no good and you need to get rid of them and uh, get in new life jackets. A lot of coaches uh, use those inflatable PFDs with those cylinders. Um, and you should know how to inspect your PFD. Uh, you know, when you buy those, uh, make sure you hang on to those uh, uh, owner's manuals. Uh, I put in a link here for a YouTube video that goes into uh, a lot of detail about how you can inspect one of those types of PFDs to make sure that it is in good operating condition. Uh, Tom talked a little bit earlier uh, about uh, launch inspections. I did work at a club in Westchester County where the uh, Marine Constable made sure that our launches were inspected, that we had a certain number of flips. We had a certain number. We had to have 22, no less than 22 life jackets on every coaching launch, uh, anchors, paddles, every single thing. And the constable would stop and inspect us on the water. It was that intense. So that might not be what happens on your waterway, but it is a good idea to avail yourself of the opportunity to get the Coast Guard or your local constable, uh, Marine Authority, to come in and perform that inspection that Tom mentioned. Hey, Catherine, we're getting a couple of uh, good questions about PFDs, uh, life jackets, yeah, yeah. and we'd like to kind of address in a bit more detail uh, a couple of the requirements there. So, so Catherine talked about, you know, how do you inspect your PFD? How do you check it, right? So if, if you have a tear in your life jacket or your throwable seat cushion, whatever, you know, other devices you're using, if they're torn, if they're dry rotted to the point where a, a good honest tug is gonna rip the handle or any other part of it apart. And if it's not Coast Guard approved or you have compressed foam, it's no longer a life jacket. It's, it's something that really belongs in a bin. Um, a lot of us keep those extra old seat cushions around because you know, I'm getting older, but they really gotta go to the bin. They've gotta, they've gotta be thrown away. So when, when you're dealing with that, it's pretty easy to know because it will feel 
heavy and flat. Um, mm -hmm. When you ask what is the right life jacket or what is the best life jacket, the, the response, and it sounds generic, is the one you'll wear. Um, we get a lot of single scholars around the country that ask us, what's the right life jacket for me? Well, the first is that it's Coast Guard approved, right? Because that's a, a legal requirement to be a life jacket. And the next one is, will you wear it, right? Can you don it? Can you don it in a hurry? Um, in our sport, we have a history of not quite embracing compliance with life jackets. So honestly, getting an approved one that you're willing and able to put on and wear is, is the right life jacket for you. There's some great resources out there. There's a website called Rosafe that you can go to that has a really good uh, tab on it with a lot of information about different life jackets. Another one that we get from coaches in this front is, you know, what is the requirement for life jackets? Well, uh, Catherine talked about having a club with 22 life jackets as a, as a minimum. Well, the carriage requirement to have life jackets of all vessels is waived for our sport due to the implied presence of a safety boat, right? So we, we believe that we're in competition is how the Code of Federal Regulation talks about it. So if your safety boat cannot see or hear the people that it is providing life jackets for, that vessel does not have life jackets. Um, that can be a difficult standard when you're coaching boats of various speeds and abilities and or the double, you know, has a rigger falling off. So you got to do you chaperone them home, but you got the aid as well. Um, the, at the end of the day, if I can't see you, I can't save you. And if I can't get to you, if I can't hear you or see you flip, see you get run over, it doesn't matter how good of an athlete you are, or how good of an athlete I once was. I am not providing you a safety boat if I'm not in your presence. So that's the right answer is one life jacket for everybody you're responsible for and you being in the presence of them. Something that happens with a lot of like high-end teams is they'll say, well, my athletes are all incredibly fit. Uh, half of them are collegiate swimmers there. And, and none of that matters if they get run over. Um, so just, as, just because it's a warm day and everything's feeling good and your athletes are exceptional, you, you gotta weigh in the fact that they may have a collision with something else that you know puts them in harm's way and none of those variables are gonna help. So. Just remember, you know, you've got to be in the presence of those rowers for that to be considered that they have life jackets. Difficult standard, but it's one that I'd have to live with if I had an injured rower and had to call their parents. It's one of those hard rules, Tom. One of those hard rules. And that's why we encourage every club to, uh, going forward, normalize it, make it intrinsic to your program. Uh, because it's it's really what we all need to do. Uh, finally, on this slide, and thank you for that, Tom. Thank you for that um, uh, elucidation. Uh, AEDs. Now, every club knows, you all know that we need to have AEDs uh, in our clubhouses. Uh, but uh, what Matt Logue actually had brought up uh, during the course of one of our safety meetings that there are a lot of grants out there for AEDs. Uh, and uh, when I asked Matt, gee, well, where should we go? He said, Google it, uh, because there are, are a bunch of them out there. Uh, what you should do if this uh, applies to you, uh, get on the Googles and uh, see what's right for your club and see if you can uh, cut a little bit off that uh, real pricey, pricey uh, price tag for those AEDs and make sure that you uh, have what you need. Um, I think we're good with this slide. Uh, we can shift to the next. Ah, oh, thank you. Okay, uh, so just to uh, give you more resources, uh, what we did here was just put together some links so that uh, you can check some of these webinars that uh, have been produced and uh, are on the U.S. Rowing um, YouTube uh, channel, and just give you some titles so that you can uh, go have a look at what you need uh, and. Uh, down at the bottom, of course, is your uh, your safety video that we've all watched many a time. The only thing I will say about the U.S. Rowing safety video is that, and I know that Jim does this too, uh, we know that it's 27 plus minutes long, but when I present it, it's 36 minutes or 40 minutes because I stop it, we discuss it, we make sure, yep, Jim, I see you there. We discuss it and make sure that uh, we go over points uh, and uh, I quiz the kids, quiz 
whoever is my audience, audience. to make sure that people uh, know what's what's going going on. on. Yeah, I love uh, spending time with the new athletes on the safety video. They, they can learn so much about rowing just simply watching that. And the announcer says, put your hands on the gunnel. Well, I, I assure you, seventh graders have no idea what the gunnel is. And you have to kind of explain that to them. So um, thank you. Great. And uh, a question just came in. Uh, Tony, I was kind of thinking that question that just popped in might sort of fall under the purview of um, adaptive considerations. Do you have anything that you wish to say? Got to unmute. It is an interesting question. And I do think it's one we have to move towards. I mean, certainly, you know, as we age, our thought processes aren't as good, as quick as they were when we were younger. And oftentimes we can't carry the equipment as far. We'd still like to row. We just can't get our bodies to carry the heavy equipment that we used to, nor do we want to make two trips down to the river if we're going to have to carry oars separately from our boats. So we have posed this question a few times to our board, not to our board, but to our rowers, I guess. And they were not very happy with us that they should carry somebody else's boat just because they were old. So I think it's something that we really have to look at because if you come in as a 60 year old you and you learn to row, you're probably not going to want to stop when you're 80 because you love it. So then what do we do? Well, I think we help them along because the older people that are in our club are probably going to be our great donors at some point because they had a place to go and they love what they were doing their whole life. But um, I don't see that everybody always sees that. So I think that's a movement that we need to look at and try to find some solutions for. A question that's come up about um, safety forums. Can we have a safety forum on the website? Our website's not uh, conducive to doing that. However, one thing, Terry, I do want to say is that we are going to do quarterly. Uh, we're going to do quarterly webinars on safety, as each of the four seasons have slight nuances that are different. Uh, we have a convention, and we will also have some very specific. Um, webinars about uh, specific topics. So throughout the year, there'll be plenty of times for us to come together like this. And, and those are places that we can we can use as forums. Um, another place, uh, rowingillustrated.com has a lot of coaches on there and you can also bring up stuff on there. There's a British one as well. And I, the name escapes me right now, where an awful lot of, of um, conversation goes back and forth about safety. Marty, that's a good idea. That's something Tom and I will talk about as well with the with the committee. How about an email list uh, or Google group? Yeah, so those quarterly, Mark, those quarterly forums will be happening. This is the first quarter one. We will be getting, we will have at least three more for the, you know, the summer one, the fall one, and then heading into winter. We will have the convention and we will have some very specific um, uh, webinars as well. Sorry to interrupt, guys. Super. Well, I guess we can uh, flick to the next slide, which I, I believe now we are. Uh, we covered that. <clears throat> there. Sorry, guys. My uh, this is so trigger happy. Um, so that was one we just did, correct? Yep. And then this one is there you uh, go. questions. You're on it. Okay. I just I just want to say, Terry, you keep getting. Two, uh, two hands ahead of me, um, you know, one of the things I wanted to say for the safety committee is I, I like the, the information we put out, but if you have specific things, Jim, I think you're on mute. Um, if you have specific things you want us to address, or there's a, uh, not necessarily like a hot new topic, but if I would like at these webinars that we have some new information to provide to you as well as seasonal information and updates. And so if you have a, this, this age question, I, I got to tell you, that's been kicking around for the last few days with us at U.S. Rowing. And it's, it's going to be something I'm sure based on the question that came in that we research. Uh, one thing, and I'm, you know, I'm only, I'm in my mighty second week with U.S. Rowing. So I think I know everything. Um, you know, everything, every question that comes in gets, gets a real dialogue. I mean, just as an example, Chris and I had a lengthy conversation from, 
a high school rower the other day mentioned a new format for rowing and whether or not we should do it. And next thing you know, you know, the head of youth rowing and the safety and well-being guy are having a long conversation where he got a very particular email back. And uh, so when you guys reach out, it doesn't go into the abyss of, you know, the machine. It's the machine is not as big as you think. So please get engaged because uh, I, I, I want to learn what you have to share. There's a lot of better practices out there that you guys know. Uh, Tom, the, uh, Nancy would like to have the, the question about the aging rower uh, restated. Yeah, so the question, the question that came across about the aging rower is, you know, what do we do as, as some of our veteran athletes um, present possible safety concerns for us? You know, how do we address that? And I think Tony did a good job of uh, going through a couple of, of things there. One of the things I would add to that is whatever your safety standards are, they should be real. And so if you say we do an annual swim test, then that's everybody does an annual swim test. If um, one of the things on the familiarization map, having a map of your area is really good, but what about putting, covering the names on it and asking all your coaches or your qualified scholars to identify the egress places where they can go to safe harbor, boat ramps, uh, significant landmarks if they had to report themselves in distress, right? So I think my perspective on, on our aging veteran rowers is just if your safety standards are real they're, and upheld by everyone, then that's really the most respectful way to address that issue. And if your standards aren't up to it, then, you know, enhance your safety standards if you're unsure. Because we could also have 40-year-old rowers who passed a swim test 20 years ago when they joined the club and have had medical issues in the meantime. So, you know, Tom, totally at the end of the day, there, at the end of the day, Jim, okay. Uh, at the end of the day, you still, somebody's still in charge of who's allowed to be a member in the boathouse, who's allowed to have a single on the rack, who's allowed to go out, whether or not you need a launch. If you, if, if you are in a situation that you feel is that dangerous, at some point you're going to have to protect that rower, but also protect the club, right? I mean, you know, somebody can't be that stubborn or that selfish where they put the entire club and the rowing community at risk. You're going to have to, you're going to have to deal with it. That's a tough, you know, a tough conversation to have. And somebody has to, at that club, be in charge of that. Um, so, you know, uh, Bill asked a question. All of our scholars in Saratoga had, take our radios with them. Um, so everybody has them, especially if they're alone. Somebody asked a question earlier about, I think it was Ann asked a question. We just use the old, the orange uh, life jackets and put them at the, behind the foot, in the foot well. Um, and our sheriff on our water, if you're rowing alone without a launch, will pull you, pull you over and ask you to show the life jacket. And if you don't, you get a ticket. Um, one of the things that we see most often is coaches refusing to wear a life jacket. And there, in many bodies of water, there are rules on the length of your vessel or what month you're in in the year. Mm -hmm. And we are setting a bad example for all the other rowers if we're too tough or, you know, we don't feel like we need to wear a life jacket. A lot of stuff's out of your control. Collisions or falling off the back or, you know, not having kill switch. You know, these are all things that, um, you know, not knowing what the, the law is, is not an excuse for, for uh, not following. So, so Chris, we're getting a couple of good questions here too. There's one on two-way radios. And what I would say is it's sort of a little bit like the answer for life jackets, right? Is whatever communication system that people will use is a good idea. I would caution you that UHF, you know, the, the little two-pack radios you might get at Costco are, are not going to have the signal strength to go around bends and turns, things like that. VHF marine radios are, they tend to float. They're all waterproof. And the beautiful thing is they ping off of different transmitters. So if there was a discussion that became I'm in trouble, the Coast Guard can geolocate where that I'm in trouble radio call came through. So if you are going to do two-way radios, I highly suggest VHF radios. Another thing I just want to give a shout out to, because I learned this today, um, our club uses um, rowing software, really good rowing software that manages our club. Well, one of its features is the ability to click one button for anyone in the boat. And now we're getting one minute updates. We're sharing our location in real time. I'll tell you in my, in, in, from my Coast Guard life that the last known position is probably the most important variable in a search. Um, every couple of minutes, the wind, the current, and everything expands our search area. Um, and I, I, this isn't scare tactic. It's just the worst case I ever had was a national champion master's 
uh, kayaker, uh, a surf ski kayaker up in Washington state. I knew exactly where he went down in two aircraft, uh, four boats and a 50 to 100 person shore search party. We didn't find him. It took too, it took too long and he, did, he lost his life. You have this new technology and everybody seems to have a, a phone with the technology to do this, to share. I don't care if you use a Strava app for cycling, you can update your locations and share where you are with people in ways that are pretty, pretty easy to do, not a big technical hurdle. And again, if it increases the chances that you have a safer rowing experience, you know, fantastic. It's it's well worth the two minutes it might take to figure out. If you can scroll through TikTok, you can figure out how to save your life with your phone. Not that I use TikTok. There's probably a lot of TikToks on it, actually. So who knows? Um, you know, yeah, we're no. talking about the younger crowd. Meet them where they are, right? Well, if they're on TikTok, start putting out some stuff for it. Um, what other what other questions did we have here? Um, did we see um, Eric Deniman's question about uh, safe sport, getting his members to uh, actually step through it? And uh, Tom, you want to address that? I mean, it's the law, uh, but maybe you can. Yeah, it's it's um, the inspiring reason. You know, I think he he put that word in there. And what what I'll say is, you know pay attention to the incidents we're having. You know, there is a clear need for safe sport not to be a, a box check. And I'm not just referring to USA Gymnastics or other sports. In our sport, we have people that are doing bad things in their boathouses, specifically with young athletes. Uh, the least I can do is take a training that takes, the refresher training, I did it the other day, and it was, I think it took me 15 minutes. Uh, and so if I can't do 15 minutes of, even if it's bad, you know, like I'm thinking about the US rowing safety video acting, um, you know, even if it's not the ideal online training, if 15 minutes has a 1% chance of helping one of my athletes not be victimized, I'd say it's a pretty good thing. The, the, but we all know, just like life jackets or anything else, that a lot of our compliance, because we're busy people, I, I understand I'm a coach and a, a parent of rowers and all the other things. It, we're all playing whack-a-mole with our time. I, I get it. But at the end of the day, uh, compliance is probably going to come from the fact you won't be able to row at U.S. rowing events if you aren't compliant. Um, that's We're looking at ways to move that up so that it isn't just regatta week that we're suddenly having, you know, 100 athletes log in and try and get their safe board done because they got a compliance message. Um, I know this stuff is tricky, but it's it's the right way to go, and it is the way we have gone. And that's a nice way of saying it, Tom. It's also a federal law. Uh, enacted by Congress and signed by the President of the United States. And if, whether or not they want to do it or not is irrelevant. It's a law. It's a law. I mean, you know, I, I don't, I'm trying, I'm sorry I'm not, I'm not being inspiring. I'm just saying this isn't, a, I'll do it if I want to. This is a federal law. You, so you will do it. And, and I, I do want to clearly delineate something. Safe Sport is not a product of U.S. rowing. Safe Sport is a product of Congress. Right. And this has been put on to all Olympic sports. Rowing is one of them. So somebody the other day was really mad at me because safe sports making them do this stupid safe sports stuff. Safe, U.S. rowing is not making you do that. The Congress of the United States is making you do it. It's a really simple concept. You'll do it. And if you don't, if you get caught not doing it, then you'll be in trouble. It's a federal law. Um, so I sorry not to be inspiring and being, you know, the meanie pants here, but that's the way it goes. We got a good question from Robert about advice for the single sculler who skulls alone. Um, what I'll tell you is, you know, enhance your safety carriage requirements, right? You are required to have a life jacket. You are required to have a sound producing device, AKA whistle, not one with a P in it because we're in the water, it won't make noise. Those are the basics, but there are a lot of devices now. Like I said, you can use your phone to update your geolocation. The other thing is make sure, and this is just getting into good Coast Guard advice. So forgive me for going past our, our, our rowing side of this a little bit. Anytime you take a small boat out, I, I highly recommend you, you need to give somebody your float plan. If it's your wife, your, your cousin, text it to your brother, whatever, right? Because if people know when you were planning to go out, when you were planning to go back and roughly where you were going, you're, you're gonna have a much better, greater chance of survival and also not having a false distress where somebody just thinks, you know, oh, I haven't seen him. Let me look out for him. When really you told them I'm going to be back at three. So your your float plan and just making sure you have vessel a vessel with adequate safety gear is a very big deal. 
your VHF radio, you can get those nowadays at West Marine or any Marine store for, you can get a single one for $50. Um, the, the location stuff on that now, even if you're inland is pretty solid. So having a VHF radio, having communications, two systems of communication, and most importantly, a float plan is probably going to be your safest bet to being that lone scholar out there. I'd like to just buttress what we said about, um, the aging rowers thing, you know, we, we love to bring up new rowers and, and who doesn't? Well, those veterans, and I'm getting there, uh, just invite them into a double. The less, you know, the, the more, the larger the boat, the more stable they are. And what an opportunity to, what a gift to row with somebody that's got a lot of experience and, uh, and is just a marvelous person still with the sport. So just, you know, go out, coaches, go out of your way to say, would you row with, with Joe? Today, he, I just really would feel better if he was out in the boat with you, and that would be great. And you know what? You're going to get off the water and say, that was dynamite. And uh, safe sport, yeah. The, uh, the world saw an incident of egregious safe sport at the two months ago at the Winter Olympics. Do you remember? You remember those lovely little Russian s skaters and how good they were? And their coach yelling at them after they didn't do a good performance? That's... That's what safe sport is all about. You don't do that. You don't do that. And that's uh, that's exactly, uh, and you know, it gets worse than that, but that was a, that was in full view of the world. Of course, Russia's not getting any love right now, but but that was a, that was a pretty clear example of what's uh, why safe sport is in existence. Well, look, and uh, you know, we can, we can differ on this, but it is a requirement that has been passed to us by the Safe Sport offices in Seattle. Uh, it's not, we did not have the choice in it. Um, it we, and we will uphold it because we have to. Uh, Rebecca, there are great videos for mentoring hours for US rowing level two and level three. Could there be more videos available for coaches to watch about safety would be helpful. Uh, yes, Rebecca, that is something we're definitely looking into building. Um, I'm just so ecstatic that Amanda put into our our budget this year that we could hire somebody like Tom, and we are we I think it'll really unlock uh, what the committee can do and 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 how how many topics we can we can actually get to now. Uh, cold water considerations. Oh, go ahead, Tom. Sorry. Uh, real quick, one of the things I was going to hit about the video is for, uh, Rebecca. One of my one of my immediate tasks is to attend some U.S. rowing led functions and make sure we're complying with safety requirements. So one of the things I'd like to do is I'll probably end up making a short video of a walkthrough of a coaching launch. To you know, these are the things you that 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 are federally required. Right? I can't verify what every state might need, but. Let's go through the carriage requirements for a coaching launch. That could be a one minute video. So I think you're more likely to see um, a f some brief videos made that may not be of the highest production quality before you're gonna see more of a comprehensive one added to the coaching education. But uh, several small videos, like how to inspect a life jacket, things like that, that's, that's, that's a much more likely situation. Cold water considerations. Tom, you wanna join, anybody wanna jump in? Or Tom, you wanna jump in? Yeah, certainly. What is the, um, if I could read the question to make sure I address if it's more specific than that. It wasn't. All I said was cold water considerations with a question mark. Okay. Um, so what, oh, I just banged my knee right into my table. That, that felt great. Sorry, all any of you suffering with me. Um, wow. So cold water considerations, we have different regions of the country that are going to have different issues. So if you're going to row on the Mississippi River in Minnesota or whatever, you're going to have a different situation as far as whether or not your water gets ever gets warm. Same thing with when I tried to row in Alaska um, and other places. And, and so one of the things you'll see in there is our 50 degree. You'll see the 90 degree. Um, you know, we like to have a come up with what is a safe practice for your boathouse for the combined sea and air temp. And remember that the water is, the air can be as warm as you want, but if you're facing cold water, that's going to be the killer, uh, and especially cold water shock. Again, I mentioned it before, but there's good information on uh, RowSafe, um, the RowSafe website about cold water shock, cold water, you know, what's going to happen. Essentially, one of the things we see a lot is people try to take too much quick effective action the minute they hit cold water. 
Um, when you hit cold water shock, everything in your body does an adrenaline dump, your lungs contract, a lot of bad things go down. The best thing you can do is take slow, effective steps and control your heart rate so that you don't panic. You'll see this with scholars a lot about the third attempt. As a coach, there's one of those cold water decisions you have to make. I will let someone make an attempt to get back in their single once. Um, if it was just an accident, they didn't get back in and they look calm and their breathing isn't out of control, maybe twice. But after that second time, if you're in cold water, it's time to put them in the launch, drag the boat home, do better next time. Because what, what's going to happen is that, that, that uh, the heart rate and adrenaline situation with the cold water shock, they're, they're going to drop before you can realize it. Another one to look at is your coxswains. Um, the unsung heroes of our sport and the most likely to have active hypothermia. Um, you'll see a lot of clubs uh, will have their coxswains wearing anti-exposure coveralls or at, at a minimum a float coat. Um, these terms are, are, if they're too much, you know, just web search them because they're pretty, it's pretty common and not too expensive. We have a lot of coxswains laying in cold, wet water in a battle loaded for pretty often. And then we think two hours later that they're not going to have a medical crisis. So another one of your cold water considerations is that. The, the, less, the next thing to combine with it is, and this is where I get really concerned when we talked earlier about safety is not a flow chart. If you tell me it's 51 degree water, right? And it, okay, it's warm enough. It's over our, our temperature we've selected is 50 for our club that we won't row below 50. And it's 51, huzzah. Yeah, well, if it's 32 degree air and you've got a drizzling rain, by the time, you know, you're exasperating the exposure to that risk, you're making the probability of that risk greater, right? So please don't just use an arbitrary temperature and think that that ends the conversation on whether or not it's too cold to row. Um, we, we see this all the time. Conversely, the sunniest day of December, when it happens to be 58 degrees, doesn't mean your water suddenly jumped from 42 to 60 degrees. So, you know, you got to be really careful that you don't let one variable in that cold water decision um, overwhelm uh, your thinking and, and your risk assessment. I hope that covered a lot of cold water stuff without going too deep into a seminar on it. You know, there's a lot of good resources. And look at your neighbor clubs. We, we got some people in the chat saying they're starting a new club. What do we do? Um, most clubs keep all their safety procedures online and our safety uh, part of the U.S. Rowing website has a lot of great recommendations for you to follow. Any more questions that we have? I, I wanna be mindful of everybody's time and night. We're uh, 8.26 now, if, but I will say this, safety is the, the most important thing that we can do. So if, if people have more questions, by all means, this is the place and time to do it. So I don't wanna rush anybody off. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Catherine, thank you for everything. Seven plus years. Uh, you've been a godsend. And um, we'll try to get you back on for some guest appearances here and there in case you get bored and miss us. Uh, and uh, Tony, Jim, thanks for joining us as always. Uh, Tom, great to have you on board and so glad that we have you on board. And uh, all of you who gave up your evening to be with us tonight. Thank you very much.